Welcome. I'm Bruce Karasik, co-founder of the Jewish Republican Alliance. Thank you for joining us today for another special edition of JRA Loudspeaker. We are thrilled to welcome back Rabbi Dove Fisher to our show. We'll be speaking with Rabbi Fisher in just a few minutes. But first, today we stand at a pivotal moment in our understanding of the fundamental rights of nations to defend themselves and to examine the principles that guide nations in the times of war and peace. In Secretary of State Blinken's recent remarks to Israel, he said that Israel has a lack of credit to conduct a military campaign to defeat Hamas, and then saying that the Biden administration would not support not tolerate large-scale bombing over months in Gaza. The Biden administration position not only undermines Israel, our closest ally in the Middle East, but also insults Israel by challenging their principles of morality, national sovereignty, and self-defense. It unfairly questions Israel's capacity to conduct a military campaign against Hamas. His comments also overlook a fundamental truth about Jews and the Torah and how it has shaped Western civilization by prioritizing, preserving, and sanctifying human life. This principle is deeply rooted in Torah and Jewish tradition. For thousands of years, the Torah has been a foundation of moral guidance, emphasizing the preservation of life as an utmost priority. To undermine Israel's efforts to balance the harsh realities of war and ethical conduct is to disregard the very principles of human dignity and life preservation that are at the core of Judeo Christian values. How can Israel? effectively dismantle organ a terrorist organization with this shadow of unfair criticism hanging over them. It appears that the Biden administration has chosen to prioritize political expediency over Israel's right to self-defense. For decades, Israel has been at the forefront of combating terrorism, facing threats that most nations cannot fathom. The state of Israel, a beacon of democracy, is, an extremely, is in an extremely dangerous region and has continually demonstrated its commitment to minimizing civilian casualties and adhering to international law, even under the most trying of circumstances. During conflicts, such as the one in the Gaza Strip, Israel has always taken extraordinary lengths to limit civilian casualties. Their efforts include tactics like dropping warning leaflets to alert civilians of impending actions in specific areas. They make tens of thousands of phone calls. They make radio announcements. They even call surrounding neighbors who have target who have near targeted individuals to instruct them to evacuate so they don't get hurt. To be fair, the Biden administration has shown some basic support for Israel and has made efforts to get the hostages released. However, we strongly condemn the Biden administration for their insulting comments to Israel and for their attempts to tie American support to unfair restrictions that handcuff Israel. We condemn the Biden administration for easing and ignoring sanctions on Iran that allow them to receive billions of dollars that they went and turned around to use to arm terrorists. We condemn the Biden administration for largely ignoring or doing nothing about anti-Semitism right now on college campuses and in our cities and in our towns. It is time for Jews on both the right and on the left to agree that Republicans and conservatives have been and continue to be the true friends of Jews and Israel. My friends, it's now a matter of good versus evil, right versus wrong, and the survival of Israel and the Jewish people. The side you choose 
will tell the world what kind of person you are. So in closing, let us say together, Am Israel Chai, the people of Israel live. Thank you all for being here. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you from the other side of the country, live in Franklin, Tennessee, my good friend and fellow JRA co-founder, Mitch Silberman. Mitch, take it away. Thank you so much, Bruce. As always, such a riveting speech. Uh, as most of you know, Stephanie and I moved to the Nashville area about 14 months ago, and we're always seeking out fellow Jews. You know, in, in Nashville, there's plenty of conservatives, not as many Jews as Los Angeles, but we're finding them. And uh, I want to make sure they know I'm Jewish. My last name's obvious, but not everyone knows my last name. So I have a high that I've been wearing every day since I got this uh, in Netanya Diamond Center in Israel in 1985. It's a high. And ever, ever since October 7th, I'm even more cognizant than ever that it has to be out. I want this to be out no matter where I am. So I was at the gym the other day, and all of a sudden this big hulking guy who I've never seen before, he looks at me, he stares at me, and he starts walking towards me. And I'm like, okay. And he points to my high and he says, I'm Jewish. I was born in Israel. I was brought up here, but I'm Jewish. And then he says, you know, I always voted Democrat before. I will never vote Democrat again. How could any Jew ever vote Democrat again? And I said, you're talking to the right guy. And then he went on and he said, you know, I've even changed my charitable giving habits. I no longer give to anything other than if it helps Israel or a soldier. And he started naming all of them off. And then he ends it and he says, hey, right now it's us against the world. And at that point, I said, by the way, my name is Mitch. <laughs> We're talking all these heavy things. Didn't even know each other's names. So it made me wonder how many other Jews are like this guy? His name is Dan. And Bruce has pointed out correctly that when he confronts fellow Jewish Democrats, how could you vote Democrat like his speech right now? And Bruce will tell you, they'll say, well, you know, Israel is just one of my issues that I care about. Fine. I think it's a Shonda. I don't agree with it. I understand it. I don't like it. But I want to dig deeper. What I'm curious about are the Jews who really do love um, uh, Israel. They really, honestly, sincerely, authentically love Israel. Are they going to continue to vote Democrat? That's what I'm so curious about. Because right now, as harsh as this sounds, it's mutually exclusive. You cannot be pro-Israel and keep voting Democrat. I'm sorry. Those are mutually exclusive now. We knew it before. It's more clear than ever now. So um, there's some good news. We're seeing some cracks in the dam. Some of them are high profile, some not as much. There's a very, very, um, very, very successful writer, director named Aaron Sorkin. I think he was behind the West Wing. From what I can tell, he's a pretty radical lefty. He fired his agent because she came out pro-Hamas publicly. And then, of course, we know Susan Sarandon came out pro-Hamas. Bam, dropped like that by her talent agency. And there's one I didn't even know. There's a, an actress, I don't even know her name, probably in her 20s. She is the lead actress in a successful movie franchise called Scream. They're now on Scream 7. And uh, apparently she came out pro-Hamas and the production company fired her. And I found this fascinating. Um, the company is called Spyglass Entertainment. I've heard of them. I've seen their logos. I've seen their movies. And I went to the website. I tried to find some way to contact them, to thank them, to acknowledge them. Couldn't do it. But these are all positive signs. So here's your assignment should you choose to accept it. I know, like me, you probably have good people in your life that, that are Jewish, that genuinely love Israel. And I would encourage you to ask them, how, how is it you're still voting Democrat? And I say vote Democrat, not that you are a Democrat, because they'll say, well, I'm an independent. Hogwash. Who do they vote for? Ask them. There, there's one, there's two major parties in America today. One has a very, very serious anti-Semitic problem, and it ain't the Republican Party. So my goal for you to ask them this question is not to be a jerk, not to be obnoxious, but simply confront them. They need to realize that if they are supporting today's Democratic Party, uh, they are not supporting Israel. In fact, earlier this week, I heard Mark Levin go on a rant. He says this is the most anti-Semitic administration since the creation of Israel in 1948, or the statehood in 1948. And now it is my distinct honor to introduce our guest speaker today, Rabbi Duff Fisher, Esquire, National Vice President of the Coalition for Jewish Values, representing over 2,500 traditional Orthodox rabbis and a senior contributing editor at the American Spectator and columnist for Israel National News, Arut Sheva, has been an adjunct professor of law at two prominent Southern California law schools for 20 years 
and previously practiced as a complex litigation attorney at three of America's most prestigious law firms. Beyond that, in his parallel career, the rabbi serves as rabbi of Young Israel of Orange County, California, and in leadership roles in several national rabbinic and other Jewish organizations. His dynamically powerful writings on public affairs, both on general political, social, religious, and cultural topics, as well as subjects specifically focused on issues concerning Jews and Judaism, particularly in America and Israel, appear regularly in the American Spectator and Israel National News. Rabbi, welcome. We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be back. Terrific. Thank you, Rabbi. And you know, you know, in my speech, way, I, in my opening, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. As you know, yeah. by the way, whenever you do the intros, something triggers me right away. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to say very briefly, Mitch was talking about how his high pendant, uh, occasionally, actually someone in Franklin, Tennessee, will come by and say, oh my God, are you Jewish? Let me tell you something. As an Orthodox Jew, if uh, you can see it, I wear a larger high pendant. It's called the Yarmulke. And everywhere I go, I'm wearing this kippah. You have no idea. I think you do have an idea, because if you tried to do this in Franklin, Tennessee, you would have even more people coming up. I was at, and I just wanted to share briefly. I thought about they're hearing that. about all this anti-Semitism in America. Um, and some people even saying, oh, my God, it's like pre-Nazi Germany. I wanted to share about two, three weeks ago, I was at the Department of Motor Vehicles, the DMV, renewing my driver's license. It has to be done once every five years. And I was online as part of that process to have my photograph taken. You know, they have people who train. There's a special training to take bad pictures at the DMV to be sure they can get a bad photograph of you for the next five <laughs> years. Whenever you have to show your ID, God forbid it should be a half decent selfie. So anyway, I was online to have a bad picture taken, minding my own business. And a lady right behind me says, excuse me. Yes, I'm so yes. Ma'am. She says, you're Jewish, right? You know, my yarmulke. Yeah. God bless your people. God bless Israel. I pray for your people every day, Christian, citing Genesis 12, 3. I want you to know, I walk through the streets of Orange County. I can't begin to tell you how many times I'm, my mind is on other stuff, right? like you, like everybody else. I'm thinking about my problems, paying the mortgage, um, the aggravation I have for my kids, all the usual things. And uh, suddenly get stopped by people because I wear a kippah. Excuse me, are you Jewish? Which is the way to start the conversation. Yes. God bless Israel. God bless the Jew. I have, I, I don't, you know, you would think from all the hand wringing and moaning about anti Semitism in America, you would think everywhere I go, people are throwing rocks and <laughs> stones and shaving my beard forcefully. That's not what's happening. There are a lot of Christians, particularly devout. Catholics and Christians, they love Israel. We have a lot of friends. You began the program with John Voigt, a Christian. And we should not, as we moan and as we wring our hands, we should not forget that this country, the people of America, continue in the polls to love Israel. And while there might be problems with the government, the people support Israel. And that's part of why that government is supporting Israel because it's got to get reelected in a couple of months. So they have to be on the right side of that. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for being back with us. Um, you know, I was very angered by some of the comments coming out of the Biden administration, because the propaganda that's going around the world for those people who want to hate Israel is that they're indiscriminately bombing the poor citizens of Gaza. Just genocide and ethnic cleansing and every possible phrase that they can come up with. And the Biden administration acts as if, if it wasn't for them, Israel would be out of control, bombing people indiscriminately. And that just plays into the hands of people who hate Jews and Israel. So that's why I would love for you to comment a little bit about that and, and maybe expand on how the teachings 
of the Torah and how Jews are educated to preserve human life affects how Israel conducts war. Bruce, I'm going to do something here with you and with Mitch. And it's going to take just about two, three minutes. And everyone else that's watching is going to be thinking the same answers. I'm going to take a very brief deposition, only a few questions. You'll see where I'm going with this to answer you. Be between the two of you, and either one can answer, state for me every single incident that comes to mind during the course of the last five weeks of the war in which there was an international outrage against Israel because of something it did during the war or was accused of doing during the war. What comes to mind? The hospital bombing. Okay. How about a proportionate response? Uh, besides the hot, well, proportionate response is a general thing, but a specific incident. So there's the hospital bombing. What else? Uh, innocent children, innocent, innocent Gazans. Which innocent, which incident of innocent God? Again, what you're doing, Bruce and I, I, Mitch, is you're giving general a general thing. I'm asking, tell me specific incident, incident one by one, where there was an international outbreak. So first of all, the, the bombing of the Shifa hospital, what else? Crickets. There has been only one specific incident in the last six weeks of war in which there was an international outrage. And then it turned out Israel did not bomb the hospital. It turned out that the Arabs, the guy shot a rocket that was incompetently made, and they ended up blowing up their own hospital, or ended up blowing up the area of the hospital. In other words, for all this talk about indiscriminate bombing, uh, what, what, for example, uh, what Mitch was just saying, and indiscriminate and killing children, if Israel actually had committed uh, any kind of immoral targeting or killing of someone against the world's rules, we all would have heard about it. And the two of you, very informed guys, following this war like hawks, all you could come up with was Shifa Hospital, which is all I can come up with, which was not even Israel as the whole world finally came to agree. In other words, for all the talk about how Israel is conducting this war with disproportionate this and tart, there's not a single incident. There's not a single incident. The general, well, give me a specific incident. Oh, well, in general, Israel's doing this, Israel. Give me a specific incident. Tell me one time in six weeks that you can, I don't mean the two of you, but that you, you Susan Sarandon types, tell me a single incident in six weeks. You can't, because Israel is fighting an extraordinarily kind of, let's call it an ethical moral war. And I want to challenge those rules of ethics and morals anyway, getting back to Torah and other things. It is unethical and immoral for a nation to willingly sacrifice the lives of its boys and girls, particularly boys, soldiers willing to die for that flag. It is immoral knowingly to, to sacrifice and risk the lives of your soldiers in order to worry about some civilians here and there who are sitting there like snipers in windows trying to shoot you. People have a right to defend themselves and soldiers have a right to act properly. Um, I recently wrote an article where I pointed out that many of these rules of war were adopted in 1949. The Geneva Convention, Geneva Rules, 19 uh, Accords, 1949. Something else happened in 19, has happened in 1949. Between 1949 and 2023, over the last 80 years, America has not won a war. The United States used to be a great world power. We helped win World War I. We won World War II. Since 1949, America has not won a war in 80 years. America doesn't even know how to win a war in 80 years. America only messes things up now. And I love America, so I'm angry about it. We went into Afghanistan, and we had to run out with our tails between our legs, messing up that situation. We went into Iraq. And we left a mess. We, when we walked into Iraq, it was a beautiful period of eight years that Iraq and Iran were at war with each other, killing each other. They killed more than 500,000 of each other. 
at a cost of more than a trillion dollars, and that was when a trillion dollars is worth a trillion dollars, and what was happening what was beautiful. And then America got in, and the next thing you knew, Iran and Iraq turned around and turned on our country, and then we didn't accomplish anything. And now it's a mess over there. Everywhere we've gone, we've left behind a mess. We can't win a war anymore following these crazy rules. And that's what they've done to Israel. Israel, it is immoral under Jewish law. If someone comes to kill you, you kill them first. And you don't worry about them. And you wipe them out. We're now having a class in our congregation on Thursday nights studying the laws of war that are compiled by Rabbi Maimonides, the Rambam, in the Mishnah Torah, his code of law. And those laws in Hilchot Malachim, Umilchamot, the laws of kings and wars, you wipe out the enemy. You wipe out the enemy. You don't leave anyone behind if they keep shooting, and they're still shooting. And that's the ethic. You wipe out the enemy. And it is amazing how Israel's getting lectured about fighting an ethical war, and nobody can even point to a single unethical thing Israel's done in six weeks of war. Rabbi is always just a brilliant summation, such a precise thinker. Uh, I want to touch on something you said um, about the Christians loving Jews in Israel. It's so true in the South here. It's remarkable. When they find out I'm Jewish, they say, oh my God, you're the chosen people. We love Israel. And it's so sincere. So I want to ask you, I want to focus on our Jewish brethren about um, who I consider a very sinister person, uh, Barack Hussein Obama. A few weeks ago, he came out and made a comment about this war. And I'm going to start with the second part first. He said that the second part of it was, um, you know, both sides need to work this out and we need peace and blah, blah, blah. But it was the first part of the statement that to me was very telling. And I want to know how you would address this with a fellow Jew who still thinks highly of this guy. The thing he started his statement was that Israel has to get out of the occupied land, something about the occupied land. And to me, that is no different than you meet someone and he says, hey, I'm a MAGA guy. You precisely know where he stands when he says, I'm a MAGA guy. When someone starts off with occupied territory, occupied land, I don't care what comes next. So how would you explain to fellow Jews who still think highly of this guy, who keep voting Democrat, how would you explain to them that he is no friend to Jews and how could you still possibly support this guy and this party? There are three kinds of Jews in America. And so there are three different kinds of ways to respond. One of the three kinds of Jews are not Jews. They're just not Jews. They tell the pollsters they're Jews. They tell Harris Poll and this one they're Jew. They're not Jews. And so they're not Jews. And I just go to them and I ask them, who's your mother? How do you become Jewish? And then I just say to them, quietly, do me a favor. Stop telling people you're Jews because you're not Jews. You're not Jews. It's like somebody grows up in Paris and starts telling pollsters, I'm from Brooklyn, but you're not from Brooklyn. You're from Paris. Now that leaves two more types of Jews. There's the Alan Dershowitz Jews who for four, eight years told us how great Obama is, voted twice for Obama, invited Obama to his birthday party, invited him to his birthday party. Give me a break. Give me a break. Go ahead now and Google or go on YouTube and do a search. Alan Dershowitz screams at Obama or some variation. He just did a rant on Obama about two weeks ago, I'm never going to invite you to another one of my birthday parties. You're so not invited to my daughter's next bat mitzvah. And um, you're you're no good. And I'm embarrassed that I ever invited you to my birthday parties. I ever called you my friend. I can't. You're. That's one kind of Jew. Those Jews finally figured it out. They're on a time delay. Just like when you're watching the news. And the report, the anchor in the studio asks a question of the reporter in the Middle East. And after the question, you wait 19 seconds till the reporter hears it on the other side and starts to answer. So it takes them eight years to figure it out. Dershowitz and a lot of Jews now have figured out Obama is an anti-Semite. Now that leaves the third group. And the third group loves Obama. 
and they still love Obama. And you know what? Can't convince them. They'll go into the grave. Their last word, right? What are the last words of most people before they die? I spent too much time in the office. So for those kinds of Jews, their last words will be, I wish Obama had a third term. And they'll never, ever <laughs> learn. But for me- He's having one now. For me, here's what I know. Right, we're having one now. That's He's the first president in American history who did not leave Washington, D.C. after his time was up. They all go back to where they come from. Nixon went back to your Belinda. Reagan went back to Simi Valley. Carter went back to Plains, Georgia. They all go back to where they come from. Obama stayed, made sure that all of his people got positions in the same, in the Biden administration. And he's this is his third term. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to say about Obama, for a lot of us, Obama signaled on day one, if we hadn't already figured it out, before he was elected, on day one, when he announced his first trip overseas is going to be to Egypt to talk about the United States and the Arab world, almost every president, their first trip to the Middle East is to Israel. Not only Trump, that guy that just got elected president of Argentina announced that his first trip overseas will be to Israel. So many of them who fly announced my first trip overseas will be to Israel. It's a signal. It says something, even if you're, before you come back, even if you're gonna stop off later in Jordan, Syria, Egypt, it's symbolic. You're talking about who your friend is. Obama started off there the same way that Biden for the longest time would not meet with Netanyahu. And that's a signal. And that tells you, without people spelling it out, they're really telling you quite clearly where they stand. Bottom line, in answer to your question, the three Jew, the kinds of Jews that aren't Jews, they're not Jews. There are a lot of Jews now that are getting the Dershowitz idea. They're figuring it out. He is an anti-Semite. He's not our, not only he's not our friend, he is an anti-Zionist. And then there's the third type, they will go to their deaths. Uh, I know I've spoken a long time, but I just want to add one more point, if I can. I tell this to non-Jews, Christian, two things I tell Christians all the time. When they come to me in my speeches and say, why do you, Jew, why do you Jews all vote left? I explain, first of all, let me tell you something. Abortion rights, okay? Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Sotomayor have done more to advance abortion than any Jew, including Soros, because no one's had the power of a president and the power of Pelosi. All three are Catholics. So why don't you get the Catholic house in order and then turn to the Jews, all right? You want to talk about another issue that you're concerned about, like gay marriage? Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Sotomayor. Why don't you go to the Catholic community, straighten out the Catholic, and then talk to me about Jews, because Jew, because Catholics vote in the same numbers for Democrats, okay? And then I point out, Catholics and Jews together are a minority in this country. And none of these laws could be passed if it weren't for the Protestants who make up the majority of the country in the House of Representatives and the Senate. And then I add one more thing. If you actually look and are a student of American history, you will find that from, nine, from 1860 to 1980, for 120 years, seven Southern states, Protestant, Christian, Bible states, voted a straight Democrat line. Now, it began originally because the Democrats were racists, the Ku Klux Klan, while the Republicans, Lincoln was freeing the slaves. And the Democrats have never forgiven Republicans for taking away their slaves. And for 120 years, Democrats have moved farther and farther to the left. And inexplicably, Christian right-wingers in the Deep South from 1860 to 1980 continued sending United States senators and Congress representatives, straight Democrats. You could look it up. Reagan could not get a majority to pass his Supreme Court nominees because he was stuck with those 12 to 14 Democrats from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, 
really right wing states, but they get now. Now, why did the Christians keep voting Democrat? And the reason is there's this crazy thing the way politics works when a political party, when a group becomes attached to a political party, it becomes very, very difficult later to separate the group from the party, even when the party changes because the group is invested in that party. The young people who want to be politically active growing up, the middle-aged people ready to be leaders see that in that party, that's the party of power. So they join that party and they become committed to that party. It's like being in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, Dolf Hyken, the state assemblyman for like 30 years, was a Democrat. He was no Democrat. He was a right wing conservative, but he saw there was no way to ever get elected except by being a Democrat. The moment he retired, he became a Republican because he didn't need it anymore. So what ends up happening is if people become initially connected to a party, it becomes incredibly difficult later to separate them from the party. What happened is that American Jews came in the largest numbers between 1881 and 1914 from Eastern Europe. When they arrived, the Democrats met them at Ellis Island and gave them money and gave them and started them and gave them money to vote Democrat. The Republicans looked at them and said, you can't come into our country clubs or play in our golf courses and you can't come into our hotels and we won't let you as lawyers work in our law firms and as doctors in our hospitals. So Jews understandably affiliated with the Democrat Party. Now, so many years later, as the Democrats have turned against Israel, while the Republicans have become incredibly good, it becomes very hard to take people away from the party that they connected with. But it's happening. And I wanted to share that there's a deep sociological and political thing going on. Rabbi, I, I, your your insight is riveting, and I know our audience is really in, in loving the things that you're saying. Uh, so educational. I want to follow up a little bit about from my our first round of questioning, and your response clearly illustrated that there was no real basis to accuse Israel of these crimes that they're accusing them of. My concern is that there are two types of things going on. One is perception and one is reality. The reality is they have not committed any crime. But when the Biden administration insinuates that they are, and when others ignore the reports that this hospital was not bombed and the propaganda that's being put out around the world, it serves to fuel anti-Semitism here and abroad. How do we take control? How can we take control of the narrative when our own president is insinuating that if they're the only line of defense between Israel and genocide? You know, Bruce, your question is incredibly important. And the answer is incredibly frustrating. You guys are doing an absolutely amazing job getting the word out you're only two people. And if you are two regular people, you'd be watching movies at home, streaming on TV. You'd be playing poker with your friends or going golf, golfing. And you would be fetching and complaining to the, your three other people in your foursome at the golf course. And in a lifetime, you would have impacted three or four people. Instead, you are impacting many, many thousands of people but we're a country of 300 million, most of whom are idiots. Um, the reality is that the word mediocre, what does mediocre really mean? It means average. And yet people take it as an insult when you tell somebody you're a mediocrity. The average person's an idiot. It happens to be, you can't say it, you can't say it. I'm not an elitist, I'm just a realist. Uh, Henry Kissinger just died, so call it real politics. Average person is an idiot. So you're asking idiots, the average person, to be able to do what you guys do and what your viewers today do and what I do and really study the subject deeply. 
even someone like Candace Owens, who all of us know, in fact, she was a guest of yours, and rightly so, rightly so at the time. Candace Owens is one of the smartest people in this country. The only problem is she doesn't know anything. If she had knowledge, <laughs> together with the brilliance that God gave her, she'd be something else. Instead, she's got all these smarts, and she doesn't know what she's talking about. But she says it very, very intelligent. And so that's our problem, that so we've got to get the information out. But who are the real purveyors of information? The New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, CBS, NBC, ABC, PBS, and in order, Los Angeles Times. So how do we break that? The Associated Press, how do we break that? It's, imp it's kind of impossible. And so what happens is, there's an overall fog of false information pushed by with a narrative from the left, because that's whom they hire. If a right wing person starts to write for the New York Times, they hire him as a columnist or her. What happened with Barry Weiss? So she was a right of sense. She wasn't even that right wing. Frankly, shows you how bad things are. The people think Barry Weiss is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Barry Weiss is left of center, actually. She's married to a lesbian. She's, I guess, guess that makes her a lesbian too, I guess. And yet the right wing looks at her and says, wow, greatest thing in the world, Barry Weiss. She was a columnist in the New York Times. She had to quit. She said, I can't operate here. They call me a right wing fascist. And she's left wing. And so what you end up with is that these media are so powerful. When people talk about how Fox News has the highest ratings on cable, and they get all excited. Look at me. It took me a while to realize that, yeah, they get the highest ratings because they're basically, okay, there's uh, Newsmax, but they're basically the only, the only show in town for the right wing. But if you add together what on the same evening CNN, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, ABC, PBS is getting, you would find that Fox News is not reaching the majority of people at all. So the majority are getting false news. They're getting emotional pictures of, of children or other people dying in Gaza. They're hearing reporters, because if you're a right of center reporter, they, they don't hire you. So they only put on the left. You know, this guy, Douglas Murray, that we all love, it's because he's the only one. And he's on basically with like Australia Sky News, which is right wing. And he's on, he's the one token right winger because he's willing to stand in the middle of a bombing, in a bombing. Um, but that's really our problem. Our problem is that, our problem, Bruce, is that how do we get through? We can't get through. So all we can do is our best. It's like what I'm doing. And maybe this will reach a thousand or 5,000 people. And we're doing the best we can. And we tell it to people and we put out, I urge everyone here, uh, whenever you see anything from the Jewish Republican Alliance, Spread it, spread it on the internet. If you have Facebook or anywhere, social media, TikTok or whatever it might be, Twitter, uh, just spread it as much as you can. And that way we educate as many people as we can. But really, we're up against a tremendous fog. It's the same in Israel. Their media are left wing. Channel 11 TV, Con, Con 11, uh, Kesha 12, Reshet 13, Ma'ariv, Yediot Achronot. They're all left of center. All we have is um, in newspapers, there's Israel Hayom, and in the TV, there's Channel 14. And other than that, it's all left wing. And it changes the entire country's perception of what's even going on. It's just, uh, it's very frustrating because I've reached a point in my life that I, as when I was younger, I felt we could really beat the media and we really can't. They, they control the narrative. The only way we can change it is by electing a Republican president who uh, at least can get, can use the White House as a bullhorn. Well, we had that for four glorious years, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, we have a really important question from one of our viewers, Dr. Tina B. And uh, it dovetails with what I did yesterday. I went kind of into the lion's den yesterday. I went to a local reform temple here in Nashville. Uh, I guess every Thursday morning, they have something called Schmooze and Views. And they were discussing in great depth Israel. And uh, it was just 
for me to observe, I could tell who was conservative and who was liberal, by the way. They all loved Israel, professed to love Israel. But the big topic yesterday is the same question Dr. Tina B is asking is, given the world opinion is against Israel, given how biased the media is in our own government, what's next? How does Israel move forward? I know where you stand. Uh, I read your, I love your columns every day. And this is a shameless plug. If you haven't signed up for Rabbi's columns, they're incredible. I get them every day and they're all must reads. So I know what you would do, but in the reality of the negative forces Israel is facing, especially in world opinion, how does Israel move forward? I, I honestly believe with all, with all my heart. Well, but first of all, you said you were to reform temple. What were they serving? Was there anything kosher there? You well, I didn't see water? a cheeseburger or any bacon, but it was it was just uh, snacks. And I didn't have any. I brought right. my own water. I was there. To, to I, just I would have brought my own observe. water, too. Right. Um, anyway, I, I hate to say it. There is a six-letter word. It starts with F, and it ends with M. And that would be my attitude. That's the only way to proceed. <laughs> I, I just figured it out. <laughs> that's the only way to proceed. If the world doesn't like it, then six-letter word. If the world doesn't like it, we have a country to save. We have seven and a half million Jews in the land that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to which the Jewish people returned after a 2,000-year exile to establish a third commonwealth that will never fall. And if the world doesn't like it, well, the world didn't like it when we came here. And during the Holocaust, we couldn't even get our refugees into the Haifa port because Britain wouldn't let them in. And the world did nothing. And Roosevelt did not bomb the rail lines leading to Auschwitz. And everybody saw and everybody knew. And then this country came into being. And everybody saw what happened on Yom Kippur in 1973. And everybody knows what's going on. And no one is going to save us. No one is going to save us. Even our one best friend that does send us weapons and does help us, the United States, ties one hand behind our backs. So if we want to live and we want to survive, we just have to do what we have to do. Continue to fight the way we've been doing such that no one can possibly point to a single thing we did in the last six weeks that was an outrage that was wrong. And we have to leave northern Gaza behind as rubble and then southern Gaza as rubble until Hamas concedes. All they have to do is surrender. Today, I wanted to take a look at the news before our interview, so I'm up to date. I, you don't catch me by surprise. Did you hear about this thing? So I looked at the morning news. Hamas is shooting rockets at Israel. So it's a shooting. Keep bombing them and bombing them and turn the place into rubble. And if, God forbid, people get killed, that's not our fault. They're using them as human shields. They hide behind mosques, ambulances, schools. They hide in residential buildings, in hospitals. They build their tunnels under hospitals. Just keep bombing them. Destroy it. Turn that place into bedrock. Flintstones, just leave behind nothing. <laughs> Go ahead and try to kill them. The Get their leaders. Kill every one of their leaders. Doesn't matter, and that's what Israel's doing. Don't leave behind even dental records. Finish them so that they're obliterated. And if the world doesn't like it, you know what? I can't think of a single vote in the United Nations where the United Nations ever comes out for Israel against the Arabs. And the United Nations is the world. And you know what? Do you know, we always sit there as American Jews, will Biden cast a veto? There's a thing in the Security Council, will Biden veto it? Will Obama veto it? Will Trump veto it? Will Bush veto it? Will America cast a veto? Do you notice, none of us ever asks, will Britain, who speaks so kindly about how we're with you. We are Zionists. We are. You ever notice they never cast about, they'll never cast a veto for Israel. How about France? They'll never cast a veto. That's our friend. I don't expect it from Russia or China, but five countries have veto power. 
And England and France, for all their talk, they don't even vote with Israel. They abstain. On Judgment Day, let me tell you, as an Orthodox rabbi, on Judgment Day, when the people of England come before God Almighty in heaven and ask for a place in the world to come, God is going to look at them and he's going to say to them, I abstain. That's, that, wow. is, that is a great quote. Mm. Um, I, you know, when you, when they say don't enter into a war until you know what victory means. And if I was, I want to get your comments on this. If I was to define victory, I am right in line with you by the elimination of, of Hamas. They have to get rid of all those rockets and that threat to the north with Hezbollah. And they have to eliminate Iran's ability to use a nuclear weapon against Israel and or the United States. And the fourth thing that I see is, is winning the propaganda war. And I know it's difficult, but I think ultimately that is just as important as these things are because without winning the war of 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 truth then you'll have the world against against you but i, I think unless you eliminate iran's ability to use a nuclear weapon and fund terrorism this thing is going to continue and now's the time to do it if we don't do it now when we have the problem first of all that biden tried to give six billion dollars to iran and even after having been temporarily stopped on that front, he's giving them like $10 billion in effectively money by waiving certain of Trump's different re restrictions on purchasing oil from Iran. So Trump had all these sanctions in place that prevented countries from buying Iranian oil. And then Biden is just lifting all of this and effectively giving Iran $10 billion, which they then use to fund Hezbollah and Hamas and these Houthis in Yemen, these Houthis, I mean, give me a break. So, okay, there are a few aspects of victory here. Aspect number one is to bomb Gaza and keep bombing them into smithereens until Hamas gives up. And if Hamas doesn't give up and all of Gaza basically looks like bedrock, at some point it starts to become there's nothing left. They've got to give up at some point. It, but you have to keep going until they give up. Now, Iran is going to be a hard fight. Realistically, you're absolutely right. Until Iran, the, the government changes or some or somebody actually does some catastrophic kind of bombing in Iran that takes out their nuclear stuff, really, um, this is going to go on. Trump came the closest to doing it without having to be, be ballistic that is literally ballistic by sending ballistic missiles by imposing such incredible restrictions on them and sanctions that he started choking them off financially. If we could have kept up Trump's things uh, for another four to eight years, it is possible we might have we might have choked them to death uh, peacefully without any war. I agree with you though, there will not be peace until something is done about Iran. But for the immediate battle on the table, They've got to bomb Gaza to smithereens. And it's going to be more messy in the South because everybody was moved out of the North into the South. So now everybody's in the South. And so what Israel just did yesterday is they put out this thing to all the Arabs living in the South of Gaza with a map, which, which neighborhoods of Gaza we're not going to bomb meantime. So that if you're living in, let's say, this neighborhood of Gaza, be aware of this neighborhood, we're going to be bombing. But the following neighbor, they actually put out a map in Arabic that every Gazan has. So this is telling them now, you've got like a day or two or three to move to these neighborhoods. And we won't be bombing you. And it's just going to have to stop on. And then you have Blinken and you have Biden saying, don't bomb this and we won't tolerate it. But Israel's just going to have to do it. And Israel will do it. Believe me, Israel will do it. And you know what's going to cause them to do it? They're not going to do it for the right reason, but as long as they do it, what's the reason they're going to do it? Because they've been doing polling, what the popular votes would look like today if they put elections. Netanyahu, who had been at 55, 60 percent, is down to 23 percent. 
So Netanyahu, now because he's so low in the polls, he has to bomb the heck out of ba Gaza and win this war to turn around the polls. And that's what's going to motivate him. So he's going to have the wrong motivations, but he'll do the right thing. And that's what they're going to have to do. Finally, on winning the art, there are two arguments I don't want to leave without us definitely covering these two things other real quick one talk about israel being colonialists this thing israel's colonialists the jews are how did the jews go to israel so let's understand two things what is colonialism colonialism is where there's a mother country and they decide they want to have possessions elsewhere in the world i'll use one example britain so you have this small little island british uh, great Brit great britain it's a small little island and then they started, they took India, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the 13 colonies, and they colonialized them. And eventually there was decolonization as each colony threw off the mother country and forced the, col the, col the colonizers back to the mother country of England. And that's colonialism. Israel, to call Israel colonialist, where are the colonies? Israel doesn't have Guam or the Philippines or Samoa. Where does, where does Israel have? And if there's decolon, where would the people go back to? Israel. So Israel is the mother country. It doesn't have colonies. So then, well, well, the Jews from Russia and Poland came to Israel. Well, those are not colonizers. The word for that is immigrants. They immigrated to Israel. If you're going to say that people who leave a country in order to be safe and better in another country are colonizers, so Ilhan Omar came to the United States from Somalia. Is she a colonizer? There are now 43,000 Somalians in Minnesota. Are they colonizers or immigrants? Uh, Ocasio, her parents came here from Puerto Rico. Are they colonizers or immigrants? Uh, Tlaib, Rashida Tlaib came here from Judea, Samaria, because there is no Palestine. She came to the United States, to Michigan, where all those other Michiganers happen to be. Are they colonizers or immigrants? Israel, their immigrants came, it's not colonizing. And it's an important thing for people to know when they get into that argument. A fabulous distinction. Rabbi, I saw, um a picture or someone took a picture and posted it and i loved it i'm gonna read it to you and then i'm gonna dovetails perfectly with a question from one of our viewers that's the time of our last question uh the sign said in front of the synagogue attention please be aware that the members of at the synagogue are armed and may use whatever force is necessary to protect its worshipers and it was in front of an orthodox synagogue in dallas and i loved it and then you, our, our viewer today, Josh L., says, uh, Rabbi, I've read your articles for years. He knows you've always been able to defend yourself physically when needed. Unfortunately, most Jews don't have any knowledge of self-defense. So the question is, do you see, have you seen an uptick in Jews realizing that they have a God-given right to defend themselves, whether it's at the synagogue or at home? Are they finally realizing that maybe it's a good thing to be able to defend yourself? Have you seen any change since October 7th? I hate to say it. I really hate to say it. There's two answers. In the United States, I hate to say it. No. And I'm going to explain in a moment. In Israel, yeah. Uh, Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir came out with this thing that Israel had not really, uh, although everybody's, whenever you visit Israel, you see soldiers walking in the streets and you have this perception everyone's armed. Actually, other than people actively in Sahal, the Israel Defense Forces, Everyone has to give up their weapons when they're demilitarized. And they have been substantially non-weaponed, non-armed. And Ben Gavir announced that we're now going to start mass distributing arms to qualified people will have to apply. But and there's been an incredible uptick in Israel in Jews buying guns. And just yesterday, there was an incident of two Arabs who terrorists from Hamas who shot three people to death in Jerusalem, and they would have gone on and killed another 20, but a civilian with a gun came running out of nowhere and shot the two of them dead. Mm. Here in the United States, there are synagogues, yes, synagogues 
have increased security by hiring non-Jewish companies to provide armed protection. But I still see Jews, primarily in America, still opting to be wusses and wimps. I want to give one example. Yesterday, um, someone sent an email to Coalition for Jewish Values. You introduced me. I'm National Vice President, represent 2,500 Orthodox rabbis, and sent in a thing with a video. We need Coalition for Jewish Values to say something about this publicly. Look what happened yesterday. There were 100 people in Queens demonstrating, yelling anti-Israel things, and stamping on an Israeli flag. And they were yelling, go back to Israel. They were yelling at Jews, go back to Israel. And my attitude was, why are you coming to the Coalition of Jewish Values? Why are you going to the Anti-Defamation League? They're yelling, go back to Israel. Why don't you get out 300 Jews You're in the middle of Queens, for God's sakes? Why don't you get out 300 Jews and yell, go back to Syria? Why don't you get a so-called Palestine flag? There is no Palestine, but the flag that go get one of those. Why don't you stomp on one of their flags? Why do you need an organization to issue a statement? Why don't you show some, why don't you show some ganuls, as they say in Yiddish? And 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 do something. And what do you get? Do something. Step on their flag. What do you? You go to Columbia University. So there's 50 people yelling Palestine from the river to the sea. So get out and get 200 people and yell, there is no Palestine. There is no Palestine. Uh, what's what's your problem? Oh no, they're yelling Palestine, they're yelling Israel to the sea. What the heck is wrong with you? Um, there's no Palestine. Go, go and yell it. Okay, you could yell also. You don't have any Jews there? You have a Hillel. Why, don't the, why doesn't the rabbi on Hillel get off his patootie and instead of uh, having a Thursday bagel meeting, why don't you get 300 Jews and yell? Well, we go to Columbia University. We can't. I went to Columbia University in 1976. We yelled. And you know what happened? When you yell, they get scared. They're the ones that get scared. They start yelling Islamophobia. 50 Jews when we're yelling Am Yisrael Chai, and then they were reporting to CARE, C-A-I-R, Islamophobia. Let them complain to their to their CJV. Don't bother me. I got I got movies I want to watch. I don't have why can't I sit and stream a TV show without some fetch, some wuss in Brooklyn complaining that some Nazi anti-Semite yelled, I don't like Jews. I can't believe it. So that's my answer. They're not getting, they got to get tougher. Jews got to get tough. We love your passion and your enthusiasm. You haven't seen me start. It's early in the morning. You know, <laughs> wait till the middle of the day and have a cup of coffee. Then I'll first get started. Before we say goodbye, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to our audience a little bit about how you engage your community, your classes, your writings, and how they can connect with you. Because of the practical logistics, um, uh, I, I would say the simplest thing is this. I'm a rabbi of a congregation, and I teach three classes a week on Zoom, which means no matter where in the world you are, you can be part of my class. Um, the best way would be just email me at rabbi, R-A-B-B-I, at Y-I-O-C, that's Young Israel, Orange County. Yioc.org, rabbi at yioc.org, and I can then have our people email you back access to our different programs, links to our classes. So there are three a week, and you particularly like the Sunday class because the Sunday ones each week I bring incredible information and stuff, clippings, not just me talking, but clips on from YouTube and elsewhere about what's going on in Israel. And I blend it with some of the current most important songs being played in Israel so that here in America, you're not hearing those songs on the radio. And that brings you up to date on who and what is going on in Israel. Tuesday nights, I teach Tanakh, the books of prophets, currently the, uh, Shmuel Aleph, 1 Samuel, soon to begin 2 Samuel, Shmuel Bet. Thursday nights, as I mentioned earlier, I'm teaching right now Jewish laws of war from the Rambam. So I teach those. You can also email me to get on the list that um, we talked about earlier, Mitch mentioned, 
um, of my writings, and I'd be glad to have you added to my distribution list. I write uh, two to three times a week for the American Spectator, and I write two or three times a week, for, well, two times a week for Arut Sheva Israel National News. Um, and that's how I try to get the word out. Well, thank you for letting oh, and you can look me up on YouTube, just Dove Fisher, D-O-V-F-I-S-C-H-E-R. There's a poor guy. I feel so bad for him. He's a professor of like engineering in Brooklyn or New Jersey. He's got the name Dove. Poor guy. He, he's <laughs> an Orthodox guy with the Armaka. And I'm sure, and he's the sweetest, nicest guy. And I, the poor guy, I imagine his students look him up. And you find this guy who's yelling, stomp on Palestine flags, and there is no Palestine. Poor guy is just trying to teach an engineering course. Um, hope he doesn't get fired. <laughs> Rabbi, you're a gem. You're welcome anytime back with the Jewish Republican Alliance. We thank you for all the great work that you do and for your tremendous support of our organization. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know the JRA is on the move. This past uh, week, my wife Judy and I were in Las Vegas. We had a great meeting of our Las Vegas chapter with a room full of JRA supporters hearing Barack Lurie talk about his new book. Uh, it was a very enthusiastic meeting. Mitch has a, a, a meeting in Nashville coming up on December 15th uh, for our Tennessee chapter in Nashville. On uh, January 19th, um, at Los Robles Greens, Larry Elder is going to be live with us for a luncheon and a book signing, and it's going to be uh, a great uh, afternoon to spend with Larry. We've got a lot of things planned. Uh, we encourage your support. If you want to support the JRA or join the JRA, go to jewishrepublicanalliance.org. Become a member, support us, help us reach more people, stay informed, get involved, and make a difference. Until we meet again, thank you so much for joining us. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we will see you soon. Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye for now. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi.